Well, a very good evening to you all this evening and welcome to this meeting and this time together. It's a privilege for me to be here. I'm Kenneth and I'm from Marlow Baptist Church. I'm the pastor there. And it's a privilege for me to be here with you this evening as we are gathering on this Pentecost Sunday. And today we'll be considering God's word as we focus our hearts on his word and consider Pentecost and the wonderful events that happened there 2,000 years ago. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visits him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. I have entitled the message this evening, Pentecost, a call to repentance. I invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2. We are going to read from verse 1 to 40. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how here we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and other parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my um, handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined counsel and the foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore, did not my heart rejoice, my tongue was glad, moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, 
because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up where we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that, that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. So just a bit of background about Pentecost that I believe is important for us to, to think through. The Feast of Pentecost is a Jewish feast. I think there is a misunderstanding about Pentecost. Many people believe it's a Christian festival or Christian feast. Nothing in the text we have read speaks of a Christian feast. The Feast of Pentecost has been celebrated by the Jews for thousands of years. It's one of the seven feasts. Israel has seven feasts. We have Passover, um, unleavened bread, first fruits, 50 days later is Pentecost, and then later on you have trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. Those are the seven feasts of the nation of Israel. Pentecost is one of those. The reason why it's called Pentecost is Pente means 50. It's the 50th day after the resurrection or the feast of first fruits. So normally it's counted as what they call the Feast of Weeks, so seven times seven on the 50th day, the Feast of Pentecost is celebrated or remembered. Now the Jews have these seven feasts, and within these seven feasts, there are very specific feasts they must travel for. You have to travel for Passover, and Passover is, on the, as we know from a Christian perspective, the Friday, Good Friday is Passover, and the next day is unleavened bread, and then Sunday is first fruits. The Jews would celebrate that together, but travel for that. They would then wait 50 days and have to travel to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And then later on in the year, they have to travel for the Feast of Tabernacles. And these are very important feasts in Israel. As we read the text, it makes it very clear what is happening, that there are Jews from all over the world, not just from Israel, but from all over the world who have traveled to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. Now what would have happened most likely would have been that they would have traveled for Passover and maybe stayed close to the area to be there for the Feast of Pentecost as well. So the text tells us that there's this atmosphere of discussions and people would have known that Jesus was crucified and then everyone says that he was raised from the dead. So all the Jews in the area would have been talking about this and been aware of what had transpired just a few 50 days earlier on. And that's the atmosphere that we read on the day of Pentecost. So why I share this with you this evening is I think there's a misconception when people read Acts chapter 2. Many people who are from a Pentecostal or charismatic persuasion will be fixated on the first 13 verses which speak about the gift of tongues. And then many others from a more evangelical, Bible-based background who are not charismatic will focus on this is the birthday of the church. Now, I'm not saying that tongues weren't spoken. They were. And I'm not saying that this is not the beginning of the church. But I think we fail 
to realize what the text is saying if we're coming to it with preconceived ideas. I don't see any birthday cakes and candles in the text I'm reading. This does not mean that it's not the start of the church, but this was not Peter's intention. I'm asking the question this evening for all of us, what was Peter's intention when he preached that first sermon? What was he talking about? Nothing in the text tells us that he is speaking to a group of people saying, this is the beginning of the church. There's no word about that. There's something very specific that he's saying that I want to encourage you with this evening. And that is why I've entitled the message, A Call to Repentance, because the passage is clear that there is a call to repentance to those that he is speaking to. If you turn with me to verse 7, 8, and 9, it, it's very clear that Jews were traveling from all over the world to come to the Feast of Pentecost, because when you look, especially verse, verse uh, um, 8, it says, and how we hear every man in our own tongue where we were born. And then it lists the countries, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and those dwell dwellers in Mesopotamia. It lists countries. And these who had come were, were, were speakers not of Hebrew or Aramaic. They were born in countries where Greek was spoken or the mother tongue of that country. And they'd come to Jerusalem for the feast, to celebrate the feast. And suddenly there's this wonderful miracle as the Holy Spirit now is poured out. And this is the appointed time for the Holy Spirit to start his ministry the ministry in the church age. He starts that ministry, and they know that something very special is happening. But they had come from all over the world. And so the atmosphere at the time was, was very specific. There was a tangible atmosphere. It's very similar to the atmosphere that when, when, when our Lord was born, there was an atmosphere of anticipation of the Messiah coming. There was something in the air. And it's the same at Pentecost. There was something about this time. Because many would have known that Jesus had been crucified. They might not have believed in the resurrection, but they've heard that there was this talk of Jesus being raised from the dead. So people were talking about this. So there was a commotion, there was an atmosphere. So if I ask you from a practical perspective this evening, when would be the best time? For the Holy Spirit to come. The best time for him to come would be Pentecost. Because most people are gathered. Most people are hearing. Most people will be open to hearing about Jesus Christ. It's the perfect time. Also, it's perfect for the Great Commission. How would the gospel go to the world but through what happened at Pentecost? And when these Jews returned to their countries, what would they be talking about? I was there. I saw Peter. I know that Jesus is alive because of what we saw. And so the church and the message of the Lord Jesus Christ was spreading. But what I really want to highlight here is that is not the initial intention of Peter, but it is the intention of God, but not Peter's intention. When I look at this passage and we look at the passage solely for what it says, there's something more that Peter is saying than just a shortcut that often is used by many Christians to say, it's the beginning of the church and let's move on. And I'm saying we miss what is being said here. Something very specific is being said. And I trust that it will be a great encouragement to you this evening. When you read Luke chapter 24 and Acts chapter 1, it says that Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples. Actually, in, 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 the, in Luke 24, it says he opened the scriptures to them. So Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples. He opened the scriptures to them. They knew what the Old Testament had said. They knew what the anticipation was. They knew the full picture of the time because Christ had told them. He also told them to wait in Jerusalem for the appointed time. And the appointed time for the Holy Spirit to come was the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago. It was the appointed time. Now, the Holy Spirit, he has done his work from throughout Scripture because in Genesis chapter 1 already we know that the Spirit is there. So this is not the first time that the Spirit comes because he's always been involved, whether it was coming upon the prophets or upon the kings. But something very special was happening at Pentecost. It was a very specific time and a change in the dispensation that God was ushering in, the time of the Holy Spirit's work inside the hearts and minds of believers. That's what's different. It's not the same in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would just come upon people and empower them. 
not actually indwell them in the same way. And this is where I might disagree um, with William Booth, and it, and it might be difficult because he was a great preacher as well, but I would disagree with him because I don't believe that there will be another Pentecost, nor that we need another Pentecost. Because Pentecost is a once-off event. It was the appointed time. Jesus, in his own words, said, this is the appointed time for the Holy Spirit to come. He will not come again because he is now here. Many people will gather in church and say, well, we must come together and we pray that the Holy Spirit will come. He is here. The Holy Spirit, he indwells every believer. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 says, every single believer is baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. As we are gathered here tonight, the Holy Spirit, he is here because he's in all of our hearts as God's people. We don't need to call on him to come. He is already here. And therefore, we understand what Pentecost is, but we don't have a need as Christians, and we shouldn't biblically, to sit around and try and pray that another Pentecost might come because there's not going to be another Pentecost as there will not be another crucifixion. It was a specific event for a very specific time. And I believe that's a bit, bit difficult for Christians because there are many Christians who, who are so, have a, such a wonderful desire to reach people. They think that all we need is another Pentecost and more, so 3,000 more can be saved. And that's very sincere and it's very good to want people to be reached with, for Christ. But we can't have another Pentecost. It's not going to happen. It was the appointed time, never to be repeated again. So what I'm going to try and do this evening is go through these 40 verses. We're not going to go through it verse by verse, so please, that's, we'll be here till tomorrow morning. Um, we're going to go through it in little sections. So when we look at the first 13 verses, very well known, the first 13 verses, and this is when the Holy, the Holy Spirit comes. Of course, the, the disciples are gathered in the upper room. They hear the noise, which is important. The noise, it's very important. They hear the wind, and the Holy Spirit is always connected to wind, Numa or, or, or ruach, it's, it's, it's the wind, it's the, um, it's the, it's the basically the, the spirit of God. It's always connected in the Hebrew and the Greek. So you'll find they you have the noise, you have the wind, and you have the fire. So all those are manifestations of God's presence. And as, as they have the cloven tongues of fire that's, that's on, on them, suddenly they then have the ability to speak in known languages. Basically, when I read the text, and I believe as you read the text, I don't believe we can sidestep the reality of what it's saying. The text is very clear. That what the disciples spoke were known languages, because when you look at verse 8, it says, And how hear we, every man, in our own tongue, wherein we were born? So without me having to get into big debates about the issue, it's very clear from the text that the disciples spoke in known languages. And they spoke in the languages of the people that had come. And they spoke in these languages as a sign of the Holy Spirit now coming and also a sign that something miraculous had happened. So all these men and women who had traveled would hear the gospel spoken in their mother tongue. My mother tongue is not English. It is actually Afrikaans. So when I'm at home with my wife and my two children, my, my baby is too young, but my son is, is almost eight, we speak Afrikaans at home. But there's something about when you speak in a certain language that you can, someone can try and speak the language, but you will hear in the way they use phrases and the accent, if they actually can speak the language or if they just speak in the language, if that makes sense. Even if you speak French, French folk will know if you proper French or you just sort of got a few words together. So the same with Afrikaans. When my dad speaks English, my dad's very Afrikaans. When he speaks English, I just, I just pray for him because it's scary. He just, it's not his first language. But I can hear. So I would assume, and I'm reading in because not saying that, but what would have happened is how these people knew that a miracle took place was that when the, the apostles and disciples spoke in these tongues, the dialect would have been perfect because it wasn't learned. 
So they would have known there was a miracle taking place. So the first 13 verses, we have tongues as a sign of the Holy Spirit. It's also a means to preach the gospel. Because the gospel was being preached to these people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the gospel would then go out through these who had come for the day of Pentecost. So it's a beautiful miracle. And it's important that we understand what that is. So we don't become concerned when people speak about, oh, but tongues are in the Bible. Yes, they are, but they are known languages. That's the context we have here. But my real focus is not on the tongues issue because that's there. But we're going to move on from verse 14 to 21. And again, I leave this with you to think through because that's when I look at, when I look at the text, I read through it and there's some very interesting things. Why does Peter quote from the prophet Joel? And he quotes from Joel chapter 2. If you have the time, if you, you know, if anyone, Andy, if anyone wants my notes, I can get the notes to you and you can get them to everyone here. So if I just jump from verse to verse, I can get these notes to you. But it's interesting because when you read Joel chapter 2, the whole of Joel chapter 2 speaks about the second coming of Christ. The whole passage is about the second coming. Here Peter quotes from Joel, and when you read, he says the sun will be darkened and the moon will turn to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. That's second coming language. Why does Peter quote from Joel? Why does he say to the people that this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel? And I believe the reason why he quotes from Joel is because the Bible is very clear. Before Jesus returns to usher in the kingdom, before his second coming, there will be a renewal and revival in Israel. A certain amount, doesn't mean the whole nation, but a certain amount of remnant Jews will be saved before Christ returns. If you want to know more about that, you can read about that in Romans chapter 11. Romans 11 tells us that Israel will be saved. So before Jesus returns, there will be a renewal in Israel. Why Peter's quoting here from Joel is he's saying that what is happening amongst these Jews on the day of Pentecost is not exactly the same as what will happen before Christ returns, but it is similar. Don't be surprised that Jews now are sharing the gospel. Don't be surprised that these things are happening amongst you as a nation because the Bible says it will. You can read about that also in Jeremiah chapter 31 when, he's, when, he, when Jeremiah quotes about the new covenant. But the most significant one is one we would all know is when Nicodemus comes and speaks to Jesus late at night. If you read through the text in John chapter 3, Jesus basically admonishes, or not admonishes, but basically scolds Nicodemus for not knowing. So when Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again, Nicodemus is surprised. And Jesus says to him, you are a teacher of Israel and you don't know this? You should know this. What is he referring to? How, does, how, does Nicodemus, how is Nicodemus supposed to know about being born again? Because the Old Testament speaks of that. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 36, from verse 25 to 32, if you read through there, it says, I will sprinkle you with, with clean water. I will take your stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. And I will bring about this renewal in your heart and life. When you look at the whole context of Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel is not speaking to an individual. Ezekiel is speaking to the nation of Israel. And he's saying that revival and renewal in the hearts and minds of God's people will come. And that is why Peter quotes from Joel, because right in his midst you have Jews from all over the world who are now suddenly preaching the gospel, who are hearing the Spirit has just been poured out. And there's a miracle taking place. It's quite interesting as well. This is a theory. But there are Jews and many Jewish rabbis who believe that the Old Testament law was given on the day of Pentecost. And when you go to um, Exodus 28 to 32, what's interesting is when they come near the mountain, what, are the, what, are, what do they see in the mountain? They see smoke, they see fire, they see noise. When they 
make the golden calf and Moses comes down, how many die on that day? 3,000 died on the day of the golden calf. How many people were saved on the day of Pentecost? 3,000. <laughs> so there's similarities between Pentecost and the new covenant and also the old covenant. But why I share that is because this renewal and revival that's happening on the day of Pentecost is not something the Old Testament didn't speak of. It did. And it was preparing them. So we move on to verse 22. Look at verse 22. Peter says, Ye men of Israel. Who is he speaking to? Who is his audience? His audience here is clearly, verse 22, he men of Israel. He's speaking to the Jewish people who had gathered now, who are hearing the word and where this revival is taking place. Right in the same context of Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31. When you read Jeremiah 31, behold, I make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like I made with their fathers when I led them by the hand of Egypt, which covenant they broke. But a new covenant I make with them, I'll put my spirit in them and they'll call, I'll cause them to walk in my paths. <coughs> what Peter is highlighting is that part of this new covenant blessing is happening in their midst. And that's why verse 22 says, men of Israel, hear these words. Don't be surprised what's happening. God has promised that there will be revival and renewal. And now, from a Christian perspective, looking back, because we look back, it's very clear what was happening. The foundation of the church, the foundation of the Christian church, was not laid using non-Jews, because God can't use non-Jews, because the non-Jews were busy worshipping trees. They were pagans. The foundation of the church had to be laid with Jewish believers of the time. Why? Because they knew the Old Testament. They were the ones who could carry the gospel out. And once the Gentiles then start hearing, they are incorporated into what we know the church to be. But I have to speak about this because many people approach the text in Acts chapter 2 thinking that this is, these are Christians. Nothing in this text tells us that Christians were here. Yeah? There are no Gentiles here. Yeah? You can't be someone that enjoys a, a bit of a pork butty and hang around here, they will kill you. You can't hang around here. If you read Acts chapter 22, when Paul the Apostle came to Jerusalem, there was riots because they accused him of bringing a Gentile into the temple area. These gone Gentiles here, they had to be Jews. And so Peter's building on the momentum of what Christ left, and I'll explain to you why I say that. So verse 22 says, men of Israel, and what is he saying here from verse 22 to 36? Peter goes on to say, men of Israel, and then he speaks about Jesus, that Jesus was handed over by God's ultimate purpose for crucifixion. And so he speaks about the crucifixion. But let's look at verse 23 in more detail. I'll read it. Him being delivered by the, by the determined counsel, so it's God's sovereign plan for Christ to be crucified, which is important, and the foreknowledge of God, now, King James, of course, is fantastic, but here we, we sort of skip over the, the term ye, because we don't normally use the term he as often. In the New King James that I read this morning, it's a bit stronger because we use the term you. So when you look at verse 23, ye have taken, it's you, you have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Who Who's, who denied Christ so that he's crucified? There were no Gentiles there. Gentiles weren't hanging around in Jerusalem at the time. Who handed Christ over to be crucified? It was the covenant people. We see that very famous picture with Barabbas and Jesus. And they said, where five days earlier, the streets in Jerusalem echoed with the beautiful sound of Hosanna, Hosanna, Baruch, Haba Bashem Adonai. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. That's what they heard five days before. What did they hear five days later? Release unto us Barabbas and crucify Jesus. <coughs> Take this criminal and we want him rather than the perfect, holy, righteous one. And so in verse 23, Peter is saying that you've crucified the Messiah. You have. And it's a judicial, a judicial statement. So it doesn't mean just because the person was maybe in Turkey at the time that they don't count. They do count because they are Jewish. 
He's saying to them as a national entity and a group, you have crucified the Messiah. But this same Messiah whom you crucified, God has raised up. Verse 24, having loosed the pains of death because it wasn't possible that he should be holden by death. The crucifixion was part of God's purpose. And through the crucifixion, we have the resurrection. But I'm still holding you accountable, Peter's saying. I'm still holding you accountable as the covenant people. So many Christians have these sort of statements. I, I would have, I crucified Jesus. Now, that's a very nice, you know, very sort of humble. Or, it's not the truth. We weren't there as non-Jews. Unless you are Jewish, you're Mazel Tov, if you are. But if you're not, we weren't there. There was a very specific group of people that rejected Christ at the time. And Peter holds them accountable for that. Also, when we move on to verse 36, to turn with me to verse 36, he goes on and then speaks about Jesus Christ, proving that he is the Messiah through signs and wonders and miracles, which they all saw. They all saw the miracles. They all saw, all saw the signs. They knew that Jesus Christ is the Christ. There's a beautiful passage, of course, in, um, in the Gospel of Luke, where John the Baptist is in prison. And he sends his disciples to Jesus. And his disciples, the, John's disciples, would go to Jesus and ask him, Are you the Christ or should we wait for another? And Jesus Christ tells the disciples of John, Go back and tell John what you have seen. And Jesus quotes Isaiah 35. The blind has seen, the deaf has heard, the mute has spoken, the lame walk. Which is a direct quote from Isaiah 35. And the gospel is preached to the poor. Christ proved that he is the Messiah. And so in verse 36, we have verse 23 where, the, where, where Peter says, you have crucified the Messiah. Got verse 36, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified. Both Lord and Christ. <coughs> you have crucified him. And so Peter lays this act and the guilt of this act at the feet of those who are standing there. Let me move on to verse 37. Now when they heard this, so when they heard the sermon, they were pricked. The New King James says cut, but they were pricked or cut in their hearts. And they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They acknowledge their sin. They acknowledge that they crucified their Messiah. And now they're asking Peter and the eleven, what must we do? Turn with me to Acts chapter 7, verse 51. So it's close. Acts chapter 7, verse 51. We're just going to read from verse 51 to 54. I'm just going to give you a bit of background very briefly here. In Acts chapter 7, we have the stoning of Stephen. So Acts chapter 2 is Pentecost. Acts chapter 7 is the stoning of Stephen. But I want us to listen to the, the terminology here. It's quite, quite amazing. So let's look at verse 51, Acts chapter 7. It says, and so this is Stephen speaking, of course. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. So I don't think it's going to go well if you say to Jews they are uncircumcised. It's a very, very derogatory term to use. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have you not, as, as not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers. So he accuses them there as well. Verse 53, we have received the law by the, we have received the law by, by the disposition of the angels and have not kept it. Here's the key, verse 54. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. So what do we see here? Peter preaches to this group. At Pentecost, and he says, you've crucified the Messiah. Then they ask in verse 37, what must we do? 
Stephen stands in front of the Sanhedrin and he stands in front of the Jews in Acts chapter 7. They, he preaches to them for 50 verses, longer than my sermon, but he preaches for them, to them 50 verses. And they say, and he says to them, you stiff-necked people, you reject the Holy Spirit. They cut at the heart in verse 37 of Acts chapter 2. They cut in the heart in Acts chapter 7, but the response is completely different. What is the response? In Acts chapter 2, what must we do? Then Peter says, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you for the, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What must we do? And we are ready to repent. What do they do in Acts chapter 7? What does the text say? They stone Stephen to death. They stone Stephen to death. There's that famous verse, and why it's famous, it, just, it always just gives me chills. When the Jews are standing in the praetorium, and Jesus is about to be crucified, you have Pontius Pilate washing his hands and saying, this man's, I'm, I'm innocent of this man's blood. And the shout from the crowd, and especially the Jewish leaders, they said, let his blood be on us and our children. And here Peter is saying that, yes, you have done this. Yes, you've done this. But they say, what can we do now? And he says, repent and be baptized. Because this promise, verse 39, is to you and to your children. And to all those who are afar off. And look at verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. What did Jesus say to those who came to him when they said, Show us a sign? And Jesus said to them that a wicked and perverse nation seeketh after signs, but only one sign will be given, and that's the sign of Jonah. So in verse 40, when Peter is saying to these people that you are prepared now to repent, you are prepared to go through the waters of baptism to identify yourself with Christ, you are the ones who this promise is given. But who is the you? It's not all Israel because Israel later on stoned Stephen. Who is he talking about? He's saying to you as Jews who he's speaking to, there is a remnant that God's going to save, a remnant that God's going to call. So if you want to stand for Christ, if you want to believe in Christ, if you want to be identified with Christ, what you must do is save yourself from this untoward generation. Because there was a generation of Jew that hated Christ and a generation of Jew that loved Christ. And so he speaks here to a remnant that God was calling and why is this so important for us? Because when you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized. What was Peter talking about? Because many people love quoting that. So when people speak to others, it's like, how must I be saved? Often they'll say, all you have to do is repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized is never used again in the New Testament except here. Paul the Apostle never uses it. In the 13 out of the 27 books of the New Testament, the 13 he writes, I would say 14, but let's say 13 for good order's sake. He never quotes that again. When the Philippian jailer comes to him and says, what must I do to be saved? What was Paul's words? Paul's words were, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Why does Peter quote here, repent and be baptized? Because what must they repent of? Lying? Cheating? Stealing? No. What does verse 37 tell us? Or verse 36? You must repent because you have crucified your Messiah. So the call here of repentance was very specific. Because the call of repentance is important. There's nothing wrong with repentance. But this repentance here is timeless to a very specific group of people that did something very specific. When we read on in the New Testament, we don't go to the non-Jewish people and just shout, repent. Repent of what? 
Because Gentiles must repent, yes. And what must they repent of? They must repent because they worship trees. Romans 1 tells us that the Gentiles has rejected God. They've worshipped the creature rather than the creator. But to go to Gentiles and say to them, you must repent because you crucified the Messiah, makes no sense because they weren't there. And so when we look at this text, what is important is, what is Peter saying in verse 38? So that we know who he is speaking to, and why this was so important, and why it's so glorious. Because on that day, 3,000 were saved. And because of this day, the church gained its momentum, so that you and I, 2,000 years on, can be here in this church, hearing from God's word. Because there were men and women who were willing to repent because of what they had done. And God forgave them because Jesus Christ said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And what we see here in this beautiful Pentecost passage is God's grace. There is no greater sin than rejecting Christ. And these men and women rejected Christ and yet God gave them grace. And we make as Christians, and this is a serious issue, we make like it's the greatest chasm is someone's sin. God can deal with sin. He's dealt with it on the cross. What God doesn't deal with is rejection of him, rejecting the gospel. That is what causes people to go to a lost eternity. Not because they've lied. Not because they've cheated. Not because they've stolen. Those things are wrong. Yes, of course. But the greatest sin, the greatest chasm, the bridge between us and, and God, that to cover that chasm, to, to cross that chasm, is the cross of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, We are here to preach a message of reconciliation. To reconcile a holy God to fallen man. And Pentecost reminds us that if God can forgive these people, and the book of Hebrews speaks about it. In Hebrews chapter 10, what worse sin is there than trampling the blood of Christ underfoot? These people rejected the Son of God, the giver of life, the Word. And yet God is gracious to extend a hand to say, I'm here and I'm willing to bring you close. And therefore, today is such a glorious day for us as, as God's people, as Christians, to celebrate that God's grace is manifested in these 40 verses in such a beautiful way. Because now we know the audience and what is being said and when it was said. So what is our calling as Christians finally? Our calling is very clear. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God calls us to be ambassadors for Christ. Our call is to a broken world. Our call is to a fallen world to be reconciled to God. And that reconciliation is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That it was in Christ that God reconciles the world to himself. And that is the gospel. That is the good news that we have the privilege of sharing. And throughout the scriptures there are these beautiful moments of grace. And I believe Pentecost is one of those. So there was a very specific call to repentance there, and it shows to us God's grace. And I pray that we will rejoice in God's grace this evening. Let us pray.